both sides of the slum. It was a dream, but now, alhamdulillah, it's a reality. Assalamu wa barakatuh. My name is Brother Omar Abdullah Dubois, aka El Dubois. I'm from outside of Philadelphia, and I've been Muslim now for a period of five years, alhamdulillah. Where I'm from is a small neighborhood outside of Philadelphia. Um, and when I go back to my, uh, we look back at my history, I had two households. Basically in a, house, a household that was very Christian oriented. Um, we went to church every Sunday. Um, you hear gospel music playing in the home every Sunday. And you, don't, you didn't find anything secular pretty much going on in the home in that, in that house. Where my mother was living, this was another house, total opposite. Um, my mother was Christian, of course, but she wasn't as religious. I went to church, but there were also things going on in the home that, of course, uh, Christians don't normally do. On that side, you know, my mother was listening to Bob Marley, uh, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, all of these different things in the home. So this is the this is where the birth, where my birth of singing began, um, as well as being inspired by my father who would come to visit at my mother's home, being inspired by hearing his voice. My early days also included me playing football, playing sports, and trying to stay out of the streets, because in that environment was very. That environment was an environment that you can get caught up very easy. It's, so my mom wanted to keep me out of the street, so I started to play sports very early. And that's, that's pretty much what my early life was about. Trying to stay out of the streets, playing football, and singing. There was a point, I would say around, this was high school time, and I had a choice whether I wanted to continue playing football or was I going to pursue a career in singing. At this time, at this time, I I started to play instruments around age 16. So I was at a crossroad in my life, and I chose singing because at the time, I remember having a football coach in high school, and it, and I see that as a mercy from Allah because I feel it was more beneficial for me to take one another path. So that I could be able to talk about, be able to talk about the experiences, of course. So I end up putting football to the side and going to the side of music because, like I mentioned, I had a football coach that wasn't very just to a lot of the players. And I remember we having an all-star team. They used to run one player all the time. So this kind of took me away from the football scene, and then I started to pursue full-time music, going to studios. First forming, I remember having groups, different groups. I started off in a singing group, formed my own group. Maybe around age 13, this is when I formed the group. And later, like I mentioned, I, age 16, decided to go full time. And this group now was, let me see, it was about five of us in the beginning. And then I started realizing later that the group thing wasn't, it wasn't good for me. Because sometimes you would, pe people, people would rehearse, turn up for rehearsal, and then not turn up. So I felt like, you know, this is like, it's a tug. It's not really beneficial because it's, it, people are not working as hard as you were. Because I, I, I lived, this was my thing. My thing was to live music and not to do it part-time, especially when I, when I made that decision to get away from sports and to pursue this full-time, this is where my heart was. Because that's, that's where my heart was from a child. You know, my mother had me doing Michael Jackson in the home, you know, sing this Bobby Brown song, performing these, performing these songs at uh, family reunions. This was, this was the life for me, early. So this was something that was, that it was bound to happen. Um, shortly after, I ended up running into a friend, 
that was, uh, he actually watched me grow up in the neighborhood. He was back home visiting, and uh, he had an opportunity to see me play guitar and sing. And at this time, I had become, I, become, I had become much better playing guitar. I started playing piano first in high school, and then I became, began playing the guitar because I wanted to experience what was it like to, to, uh, to hear different instruments. So I started playing guitar, and I became good at playing guitar and singing at the same time. And he had an opportunity to see me play and sing, and he ended up inviting me to California, maybe about a month later. So I ended up coming to California, going to California, and subhanAllah, as soon as I got to California, as soon as I landed, the next day we were going on meetings. That, that next day I was in Magic Johnson's office, having a, having a meeting for him to sign me as an artist on his label. And I was going to various labels. At the time I went to Virgin, I went to Sony, and I ended up going to Def Jam. I never forget these things because they were, this was, you know, it's amazing how Allah takes you through a certain path to experience certain things, to be able to talk about certain things. So I remember Magic Johnson's label, they were going through problems at the time. So I had a meeting with Def Jam, another meeting, another meeting, about four meetings with Def Jam. And I ended up being signed by a person by the name of Leo Cohen and Tina Davis. And this is after I met with also, who was a president of Def Jam at the time, was Kevin Lyles. Signed with Def Jam, stayed with Def Jam for about two and a half years, worked with a lot of different producers, such as Raphael Sadiq, Mike City, uh, Various different people. Some people that um, work, have worked with famous people such as Mary J. Blige and different artists. After, after staying with Def Jam, as I mentioned, for two and a half years, ended up parting with them due to differences. Worked hard on my own, trying to pursue more of an independent route as well as taking meetings to go and um, seeking a second record deal. And I remember that, that probably that next year after I got off of Def Jam, I probably went on about 13 meetings and no one signed me. And we had speculation that maybe, you know, it was a, I was blacklisted because of some of the people I had on my team. <laughs> We had speculation, but it was all it was all mercy from Allah, because I look back on that. You know, had I been out there, and I don't want to save that for for later. Shortly after that, now I began really more so doing an independent thing, taking an independent route, trying to push myself out there, performing more live putting videos up on, on the internet. And this is where people started to more recognize me. I was playing on the street at the time just to get the experience. Just to get the experience and also have the intention to do commercials. So I ended up landing a commercial deal, doing commercials. Um, shortly after that, had a major project in mind. Major project to launch for an international project. And something I still haven't seen many artists doing to this day. But before I launched that project, this is when I embraced the snap. And at that time, before that occurred, I had been studying Islam for about two and a half years. 
that time. The first book I read on Islam, if I remember correctly, was a book written by Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimullah Ta'ala, translated by Dr. Bilal Phillips. It was a book called Essay on the Jinn. And I read this book first because one of the brothers noticed that I had a, a fascination with the unseen. He noticed that I, because I had been hearing about the unseen since I was a child. So I read about this. I read, to the, I read this book, and subhanAllah, this book blew me away. Because he was speaking from evidences, not speaking from his desires. A lot of things that I had read on the unseen before that really didn't have evidence to prove anything to me. He was coming from the evidences that he knew from the Quran and the Sunnah. And even though I wasn't a Muslim, it made total sense to me, subhanAllah. Shortly after that, I ended up reading the Quran. And by the way, this Quran was sitting on my shelf for some time. I don't know why I didn't read it at the time, I couldn't remember. I think I was extremely busy at the time. I ended up reading this Quran in my room. And when I was reading this, I remember having a feeling, saying to myself that there's no way a man could have written this. Because by that time I had studied the Bible. I had studied different religions, different ways of life. And I had certain things that would let me know, a list of things that I followed to let me know whether something was the truth or not. Something had to be universal, number one. That means for all people. It had to be for all people because the church I grew up in was a church, it was for all black people. It was a church that I didn't see a single white person, nor did I see a single Arab, nor did I see a single person from India. So that uh, the way of life that, that, that I was searching for had to be something universal for all people. Number two, it had to be something, and this is not in any particular order of numbers, but it also had to be something that associated that didn't associate anything with the Creator, that believed in one God. If something said that we believe that there's a God besides the Creator, then I would know that religion is not the truth. And number and another thing, it had to be something that had a book that hadn't been changed. So when I read when I was reading this Quran in the English translation, it was speaking about all of the prophets. It wasn't holding one prophet up here or one prophet down here. It was speaking of all the prophets of the Creator, all the prophets of God having the same message, meaning believing in the same God, calling to the worship of this same Lord. So I said to myself, and also this Quran was speaking directly to me. It wasn't, it wasn't saying John said this or Mark said this or anyone said such and such. It was speaking directly to me. So after I read this, I said, there's no way a man could have written this. And I entered the masjid. I remember entering the masjid in L.A. And I said to myself, I said, this is the truth. Because when I entered the masjid, there were people of all different colors. All different colors and shades. And I had never seen that before in my life. Never seen that before. So that was another thing that convinced me that Islam was the truth. When I saw that, shortly afterwards, I embraced Islam after some encouragement from some friends that told me, you don't want to believe, say you believe in the heart, and don't accept Islam. Because I was dragging on my, I was dragging on my Shahada. I didn't actually know what the Shahada was for some time. So I was giving dawah to people about Islam. This is, this is very, this is crazy. I was calling people to Islam without being a Muslim. <laughs> so I finally embraced Islam myself before putting out that major project. Allah saved me because had I been out there and Allah knew to, to snatch me away from that at that time. Because had I been out there, way out there, there's no telling whether I would have accepted the guidance or not accepted the guidance. How has Islam changed my life? Where do I start? Because there's so many things that I can speak about. One of them 
being that, for instance, everyone has problems that they face in their life. Everyone. Everyone deals with the same issues. Islam gives you the solutions to your problems. It gives you the solutions to your problems. Because otherwise, we just be dealing with problems without the solutions. Islam gave me these things. Islam taught me how to have a more, a higher respect for women. I respected women to a certain degree. And then I disrespected women to a higher degree. Because I didn't have I didn't have the guidance. How do you know how to respect a woman if you don't have the proper guidance? You know, I had a good mother, you know, I had a good family. But the reality of it is is that you know you don't you don't know anything. You're misguided. Without the, the guidance of the MBA, the prophets, without the guidance of Allah and him sending the, the you know the, the, the prophets to us for this guidance. Without this guidance, we're, we're in darkness. So Islam has taught me these things. Islam has taught me how to be generous and more kind to my parents. This is another issue I had. You know, I feel like many times that I didn't respect my mother the way she should be respected, you know? And this was a problem as I was growing up. So Islam has taught me the importance of this. Allah says in the Quran to worship him and to obey your parents. I wouldn't have learned it without Islam. Islam has taught me to be more conscious of the poor, to be more conscious of my neighbor. Your neighbor has rights over you in Islam. So Islam has taught me this. I mean, the list goes on and on. The, the Islam has taught me to be more morally conscious. Islam has taught me how to pray properly, how to pray to one Lord, because as a Christian, we didn't know how to pray. We didn't have a clue how to pray. And this is one of the things that fascinated me. One of the things that fascinated me is that I used to see Muslims pray. And it used to, it used to remind me of what I saw in the Bible. Moses praying. Moses praying a certain way. Jesus praying, falling on their faces and praying. Moses and Aaron washing up for prayer. Washing up for prayer. So, Islam taught me the correct way to do this. Um, but, all in all, I say that Islam has totally transformed me. Anyone who, who has known me before Islam can testify to that. I don't, sit I don't have to sit here and tell the people how much it has transformed me because people that know me know that I've been transformed. Alhamdulillah. Praise be to the Most High. What advice have you got to non-Muslims and Muslims regarding Islam? As for the non-Muslims, I have some very good advice to give you. And this is to reflect on your purpose of life. Reflect and think to yourself, are you pleased with your current situation? And think about this. You know, someone like myself, for instance, my life was going to clubs, playing in nightclubs, and literally waking up the next day, speaking to, speaking with many of my friends, and we would speak to each other and ask ourselves, does any of that that took place last night even matter right now? Does any of that even matter anymore? And the question, of, and the question is no, it didn't matter. So I want you to question yourself. Is what you did yesterday important for your life? Will these things assist you when you're in that grave? And this is another thing we, we fail to think about, and this is death. Questioning ourselves about the grave, reflecting on the grave. Is what we're doing beneficial for our lives in the grave? There are three things that will go with you, and one of them will stay. Your deeds will be the only thing that will stay with you. Your mother will not be with you. Your father will not be with you. And so these are the things for us to reflect on. Your children will not be with you. So we all need to reflect on this. And if you are serious about learning about Islam, read from Islamic sources. This is very important. Read from Islamic sources. 
And number two, ask your Lord, your Creator, the Most High. Ask Him sincerely for guidance to guide you to the truth. And no doubt about it, He will guide you to Islam. As for the Muslims, for you, I would encourage you all to, to strive, to strive on this path because the path you're on is correct. The path you're on is correct. And I mean as if you are on the path of the rightly guided. The first three generations. If you're on the path of trying to strive upon the Quran and the Sunnah, you're on the righteous path. And I pray that you stay on this. And I encourage you to continue with the Salah on a daily basis. If you are even... Maybe, you, maybe you're not praying right now as you're watching this. Maybe you're not praying. Start. Make the intention. Don't delay. Make the intention. Start to make one salah. Then you're making two salah. But don't say, oh, I'll do it later. Oh, I'll change myself later. Oh, I'm young. I'm still young. Hmm. Fear Allah, brothers and sisters. You don't have a contract with Allah. And if we say, wait till later, I wait to this day, then we're trying to, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to pull the mick on Allah? As we say, as brothers say in the UK, are we, are we trying to pull a stunt on Allah? So reflect on your life. That is my encouragement. And finally, I want to give a shout out to brothers from Roadside to Islam for inviting me, mashallah, beautiful brothers, mashallah, and um, I'm delighted to have giving you just a glimpse of my life once again um, all praise is due to the most high I seek his forgiveness if I've said anything that is incorrect it's for myself and the shaitan and Allah, I pray that Allah rightly guides all of us, keeps us rightly guided and guides all of you and blesses you with a happy place in the hereafter, I mean Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh